I'm Anand. I'm a software engineer at DigitalOcean and the virtual private cloud team. And the reason I'm giving this talk today is because I feel that DigitalOcean is one of the only companies I've worked with so far that has figured out the right ecosystem of how to develop great software. So there are multiple teams that ship software to production every single day. And I wanted to share some knowledge around how is this thing done? Like from inception of an idea to developing the product, what does the entire phase look like? How do we develop monitoring and metrics for our applications, alerting? How, what does our entire infrastructure look like? How do we develop pipelines uh, that automates our entire deploy, deployment and testing process? And um, I also wanted to share some very crucial things that I feel uh, every engineering culture should have that enables uh, that sort of passion in engineers to build great products. Uh, I said I'm software engineer on the VPC team. I did my MS in computer science from the University of Texas at Dallas. And while I was studying, I interned at DO in uh, 2017, where I developed a project called as the Go IPv6 project. Um, it is now part of a project, larger project called as the Gateways team and is live in production. It enables reducing our traffic, uh, certain networking concept, uh, but in the v6 world, in our entire data center. Uh, so that's proving to be uh, very helpful to the teams right now. And then I joined DigitalOcean as a full-time engineer in January 2018 at the New York headquarters. Uh, since then, I've worked on multiple teams within the software-defined networking space, uh, VPC being the first. I then migrated to IPAM, which is IP address management, developed solutions where it keeps a tab on our entire IP infrastructure, which, cause, which costs DigitalOcean millions of dollars since we are in uh, the cloud space. And then I migrated to, in, to working for VPC API currently. Uh, so how, does, how do the front-end services integrate with virtual private cloud on the back-end? Um, mainly worked with scalable distributed systems, uh, microservice architectures, monitoring and alerting systems, CI-CD pipelines, test automation, and more. And yes, that's my contact information in case you'd like to get in touch. Uh, the agenda for today's uh, talk will be around understanding what the development lifecycle for new projects at DO looks like. What are the tools and technologies used by DO engineering teams on a daily basis? And what is the engineering culture at DigitalOcean? As I'm part of the SDN team, I'll be talking about how do we build products here from, from the inception phase right through post-deployment. And uh, this is this, it's very similar across teams, but with minor differences. So whenever we want to build a new product, new product, how do we decide on what product should we build next? So we have a business and product team that interacts regularly with uh, customers on a daily basis, understanding what needs do they have. Uh, what, do, what new products do they want in terms of networking? From And these are not just like large customers, even single droplet customers. Uh, these product folks, they constantly, every week, they have two to three meetings with different customers, understanding what are their requirements, what do they envision for networking in the future. Uh, then we sort of prioritize based on the requirements, even having a look at uh, what some of our competitors are doing. And uh, after that, we basically determine based on priority that for the next three years, what does our plan for shipping new SDN products looks like? Now, these products are not necessarily just customer-facing products. They may be even internal products that manage our own internal data center networks very, very efficiently, which in turn makes the customer products very, very fast and efficient to use, low latency is highly available. So like some of our products are firewalls, VPC, domain name service, load balancers, floating IPs, internal products, gateways, IPAM, hypervisor-based daemons, uh, open vSwitch, which is like a really great open source tool that we use. So the product teams help us answer what is next. After we basically realize that now, let's say VPC is decided as the next product that we want to ship over the next uh, two years and multiple releases, uh, how do we, like, how does the tech team actually visualize that this thing needs to be made a reality? So what are the new services that will be required to be developed? Yeah, so we basically start with an RFC, which is a request for comments document that is uh, circulated across the engineering organization for comments. Everybody, uh, all engineers within the organization can comment on 
specific parts of the RFC on what they feel may fail uh, for these particular architectures or these particular designs. And that RFC, which is like a large level overview, is basically honed for a couple months before it's actually finalized. So this involves like, what new services do we need to develop? What are the existing services that can be expanded or reused? What are the integrations with existing services that need to be done? So it's easy to develop a system which is new and does not depend on anything else. But when you have, imagine that uh, someone wants to go to work, but you need to perform an operation on it and put something into their body right now. So we, we need to figure out of having zero downtime for customers, especially in networking because it connects everything. But how do we plug in that new system inside, keeping everything else in place? So no existing services should break, but a new service coming in, that needs to be added and shipped to customers incrementally. So that's something that we need to think about uh, at the very beginning. So that is why integrations play a very important role. Then study of the best tech, to tech and tools. Um, so for example, for networking projects, uh, RabbitMQ is a, bat, is a better messaging system as compared to Kafka. So we just don't basically pick up tools which are uh, known in the market. Hey, we know that Kafka is a messaging queue. Let's just pick it up and start work. There will be a research phase where multiple tools and technologies, especially open source technologies will be tried out. And after we, we do benchmarking, we do a lot of testing on it based on the scale that we want to grow. And after that is decided, then we fix on a particular technology to use. Um, high availability and latency requirements, those are thought of as well. Uh, after we have the large level overview RFC, the next phase is when teams are decided, uh, larger teams are decided on to who will be working on this particular project. And the larger level architecture of the system is designed. So there is an, there's another RFC for this, where we basically break down what distributed systems will we need, or in existing distributed systems, what microservices will we be adding? What are the type of messaging systems, databases, that we require, will we be hosting it on Kubernetes or do we need hardware nodes for it? Um, again, we then dig a little bit more deeper into integrations, uh, pinpointing what exact teams do we need to collaborate with and uh, what are the type of APIs that, that we are looking at here. But no, no strict definitions out here at this layer. That will come in the next part. Uh, we need to have a basic understanding of how data flow will be happening in these architecture diagrams. So, from the, for example, from the front end, when it goes through the API service, what backend services would be involved from compute, from storage, from networking, uh, at least having a basic level of understanding so that we don't break any existing service because existing service expect things in a certain way and making sure that those existing services don't break and we are able to like seamlessly transition into the new path. Uh, this also involves thinking about backfilling data. So when we say backfilling, it means that we have a bunch of existing customers with a certain uh, type of arrangement of data, but now we are introducing a new service. So databases will be updated, new columns will be added and stuff like that. So how do the existing customers, how do, how do their, their data be uh, backfilled for those new columns which are being added? So, um, that's something we think about as well uh, at the very beginning. Architecture diagrams, and yes, we have some, some people known as technical program managers whose primary responsibility is to enable collaboration across multiple teams. Figure out what the bottlenecks are in terms of communication and basically enable, uh, like removing of those bottlenecks, enabling that communication so that dependencies are removed. Uh, yes. After this, now we, Basically, now we have an idea of what the larger level system will look like. So now we break down into specific microservices and either individual developers or small teams are assigned to each microservice. Now we dig into extremely detailed specifications, how this microservice will be developed, uh, what are the exact list of services that interact with this specific microservice, what, is, what are the exact API contracts that, will, that we will have, uh, the request response at the API layer takes starts taking shape. Will this uh, microservice 
be functioning asynchronously or will it will it have some synchronous interactions so for so what i what this means is uh, even within uh, within the microservice when you're making function calls or when this microservice is reaching other microservices are you waiting for a response to proceed further uh, or is your system that robust that you don't need to wait for the response to come back right now you can just have parallel processing going on and your responses are handled in a certain way that you can have an asynchronous design for your system so we think a lot about making systems asynchronous because that that is what basically helps us with scalability in the future enable as much parallel processing as you want until synchronous communication is absolutely required uh, we design a lot of swim lane diagrams there are two tools one is swimlanes.io and there is uh, there is a software called as miro uh, which are extremely useful in designing data flow diagrams like which service will call which service what happens during a failure if it succeeds what are the responses that is happening uh, basically having an entire chart of how your data is flowing through the interacting systems which are there so uh, this is something that we work on uh, at the at this level we also have an internal rfc which is uh, shared within the team uh, where basically we brainstorm a lot of ideas of where the failures can happen what can go wrong how do we auto recover from failures and uh, uh, stuff like that i wanted to share a few tools as well but i'll see if i have time uh, at the end yes and basically determining how the service is going to be deployed if we are going to deploy it using kubernetes do we want a centralized service do we want a regionalized service will each region like new york san francisco bangalore have their own version of the app and people in that region whenever they make requests will they be only reaching out to that particular region to re to reduce their latencies so these decisions are sometimes having regionalized services at the very beginning is very difficult because uh, some of our databases are centralized and to migrate away from that is a bit painful so we try and see what can be regionalized and what is centralized so those are things that are thought about yes message queues versus direct api interactions so do you want uh, your microservice to directly reach out to another microservice in terms of requests or do you want a message broker in between like kafka where you deposit your requests and the other microservices basically reading from that re reading from the other end uh, the reason i say this is because at times uh, the amount of load that one microservice is receiving might might not be suitable to send the same amount of load to the other microservice so you need to allow some breathing space for some microservices to basically take requests at a pace that they can handle and that is where ka ka things like kafka and rabbit mq they become extremely useful where they ensure that once your data is on to the message bus uh, we will ensure redundancy we will ensure that your data isn't lost and it and it will be read by the other microservice at the pace that it can handle and then respond a very important thing for asynchronous communication what are the type of databases that we use now there's a lot of talk about no sql databases sql databases even using redis or mysql within the team uh, like redis would be like a key value store but at times what happens is at the ground level we need to understand what is the support of this db across digital ocean as a whole if we are one of the only teams that is using this database it's uh, we sometimes basically choose not to do that because it's not good to create different ecosystems within the same organization uh, when someone else is transitioning to this team things may get a bit chaotic so support within do engineering is is some uh, for that db is very important uh, high availability and latency requirements some Uh, for example we have a service called as ip address management which is required for each droplet create now this requires minimal latency because if there is high latency it increases the create time for that particular droplet so how do you design that system so that it has extremely minimal latency uh, it has to ensure high availability so having load balancing even multiple kh nodes uh, ha proxy all of these things come into consideration at this level now i'll start digging a bit into what our tech stack looks like so we we have go 
uh, as our primary uh, technology for implementing backend services. There is some legacy Perl as well. Uh, we use gRPC, which is Google Remote Procedure Calls, for all the API, uh, API endpoints on our backend services, but to fetch information from the front end, we use REST APIs, which basically call our, which basically call things like VPC API and our API services. We use Kubernetes very, very heavily at DigitalOcean. We have an internal uh, service, which is called DOCC. It's like a wrapper on top of uh, uh, Kubernetes, so that the engineers don't need to figure out what the nitty gritties of KHs are. We basically give them a manifest, define our alerts at the manifest level, and once we just give it, we, we, we have a command called as DOCC deploy and just pass in the manifest. It does, it automates everything for you and maintains the infrastructure. We have an internal service called as COD, uh, which is, which basically automates our entire MySQL data store creation. So earlier what used to happen is that teams would use MySQL, but in a way that they would want to use it, have their own failover principles. How would they create replicas? Uh, so now we have a general policy. Cre they created a wrapper on top of MySQL databases, similar to the managed databases that we have, but this is used for internal purposes. Uh, they have a document. If you want to create a data store, uh, this is the list of things that you will need to do. They'll decide, they'll define the security policies, give you tokens, keys to access the database, and only specific people will have access to that database with certain privileges. So th that has been um, like amazingly useful for us. Uh, we use Kafka and RabbitMQ, Kafka like much more than RabbitMQ for message pipelines. After this, uh, <clears throat> for uh, rollouts, we use Ansible. So say uh, I have a new release for VPC which is coming up. Um, what, how will we roll it out? So uh, Ansible is used very heavily for there where you can define your list of hypervisor nodes. Uh, in a particular region, and you can basically say that this is these are this is the new code or the, these are the new scripts that you want to deploy and run on those particular nodes in a particular data center. And Ansible will basically automate the entire process. You don't need to log into each node and then deploy your code onto that. Give Ansible what scripts do you want to deploy? What is your latest state of code? What are the list of nodes that you have? What is the region that you have? Click enter, and everything is deployed automatically. AWX is a further step above Ansible. It automates things within Ansible as well. It's a wrapper on top of Ansible. We, we start using that as well. It's a great UI tool um, where instead of even writing certain YAML files yourself, um, AWX basically gives you a great UI representation where your nodes can be defined through the UI. Uh, you can point to certain scripts. How do you want to arrange your entire, you can even break down your deployment process into multiple steps, like do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. Nothing is, ma nothing is done manually. It's extremely looked down upon, and no one is allowed to touch a node manually uh, at DigitalOcean. Uh, we use Chef for ensuring configuration across nodes, so we want each of our hypervisors in a particular region to have a certain configuration that is standard across all nodes. Now let's say someone with uh, a certain privilege logged into a certain node and made certain configuration changes for some testing purpose. What Chef will do is, it runs, every, it runs periodically. So every 30 minutes or one hour, it logs into that node and loads the standard configuration back. So even if a node is broken, it'll be brought back into that same level of configuration. Shell scripts are extremely important to us still. Uh, we use it heavily for backfilling data, uh, even ensuring whether our database backups are happening correctly and as part of our CI CD pipelines as well. We make heavy use of Elasticsearch and Kibana for logging. So Elasticsearch basically stores or uh, indexes all of our logs uh, from all of our applications. And Kibana is a great tool for visualizing these logs, especially during errors. So let's say that a certain, a certain microservice or a certain system is failing for us. And we want to basically at least get a first idea of what exactly is failing. So Kibana is a great place to start looking at at the at the at first so what we essentially do is go there filter based on a microservice and say filter logs which have errors in them 
and it gives you the entire list of logs uh, in Kibana saying that this is the exact function at this line, this is the failure that is happening. So that gives us a, a, a really good point to actually start towards the solution for fixing that problem. Uh, a better thing in Kibana is it also has on-demand graphs. So based on your logging, uh, you can also generate uh, like complete graphs based on specific log conditions like what are the number of uh, what are the number of logs in the past hour which have this particular error rate? Uh, things like that, and it can get into much more complicated things, and on multiple axes, not just two axes. So Kibana is a great tool to look at. We use Prometheus, which is an open source metrics uh, and monitoring system, and Grafana for developing dashboards based on Prometheus metrics. So uh, this helps us keep keep a very very uh, strong tab on. What, what latency do our microservices have? What is the request per second or the traffic that we are having right now? What is the error rate that we are facing? Are my services getting saturated? Lightstep uh, is another tool that we use. So um, in Lightstep, you can basically visualize what microservice hit what other microservice hit what other microservice and the entire path of failure. When you have so many microservices hooked up together, getting that entire path for understanding where, how did the failure actually happen. That, that power is amazing uh, and we get it through Lightstep. Uh, Lightstep is also like um, very useful in, in setting up quick alerts based on, say if you, if you feel that you are having a certain error rate or uh, a high latency for your service or uh, a very high traffic coming into your system, these are the only three that Lightstep supports. Uh, so it's good for quick alerting, but not for long-term alerting needs. Where uh, I'll just discuss how do we do how do we do some very very complex alerting using Prometheus um, in the next slide. But if you just want to get started with alerting, Lightstep is a really good tool. After this, we use a lot of Prometheus alerts very very heavily. Uh, there are some very complex queries that you can write in in Prometheus for understanding different failure rates or understanding CPU usage, or RAM usage, even much more complex things like understanding specific types of error rates which are there. We have a centralized uh, team called as Observability, which maintains our entire Elasticsearch and Prometheus alerting. And we basically write Prometheus alerts in YAML files. Uh, we submit it to them and they ensure that these are going to be active and they're going to scrape it. Uh, they're going to make sure that if a certain state happens, they alert you based on the condition that you have. You may either end up sending a message to Slack, calling up through PagerDuty, or uh, even sending emails. And there's some, something else that we use which is called as Red Alerts, which is our implementation of Elasti Alerts, short form for Elastic Search Alerts. It's an open source project by Yelp. And this allows us to specifically alert based on logging trends. If we feel that a certain type of logs that we see are basically scary for us, then we basically alert based on those log trends. Prometheus doesn't allow you to alert based on log trends. So if you're looking to alert based on logs, then red alerts uh, should be the option. Then pager duty, um, if you have an engineering team, there should always be someone from the engineering team on call. If something goes wrong, that person would be called even at 2 a.m. in the night, 3 a.m. in the night, and would be expected to fix that. Um, PagerDuty allows you to hook up with uh, SMSs, Gmail, uh, any email service, uh, calling. We use a lot of, and Slack, and we use, uh, like our critical alerts are all hooked up to uh, calling, calling the engineer on call. So that's there, we use Slack a lot. It's a great communication medium. But apart from that, it has vast amount of integrations. Like Slack gives you a token, which you can use it anywhere, in bash scripts, you can even use it uh, in your Prometheus alerts, wherever you want to, and whatever you uh, trigger or whatever message you want to send, you can send it on a Slack channel uh, when a certain state happens. Then we use Concourse, it's a open source CI CD pipeline tool, so we design our own pipelines. So essentially when, 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 a, when a team builds a microservice or a system, they are responsible for all of these things. We don't delegate anything to another team. 
that builds our pipeline or anything, we are responsible for doing that. So in Concourse, you can basically have master pipeline and PR pipelines. They are constantly, um, every one minute or something, there'll be a search to see a change in state for master and PR pipelines. A PR is pull request uh, in, in Git. And what happens is that if, if a change in state is seen, it triggers an entire pipeline. First, you would test your, uh, run a bunch of tests on your new code. Then you would write a piece of code to update your image in the Docker registry automatically. And then finally, you would have like a deploy step, which picks up that latest Docker image and deploys it on Kubernetes automatically. So no manual intervention after you go online, live. Uh, we have automated canary tests as well, apart from unit and integration tests. So what Canary tests do is they're always live 24 7, 365 days. And when, it, and they're just checking whether the basic functionality, like for example, if we have VPC, uh, it'll spin up two droplets, put them within the same VPC, put them in separate VPCs, uh, put them in different regions and stuff like that. And then you'll try to ping each other to see if they are in the same VPC, they should be able to. But if you're in separate VPCs, and if you're still able to, it'll fail the canary job. You broke, you added some sort of uh, code that has broken an existing canary test. So can canaries are extremely important for us because uh, it, it basically makes sure that your functionality for which your system is designed, that is working right now. Uh, and these are developed after we have unit and integration tests in uh, place. We use GitHub Enterprise for maintaining our code repositories and Goland, VS Code and Vim uh, are some IDs that we use for coding. Uh, I support Goland right now. What, what, what do we do post deploy? So first of all, we when, whenever we have a new change that is being deployed, we roll out by DCs, uh, data centers, We're starting from the smallest data center first, so that if there is any failure observed there, we roll back immediately figure out what issue happened, um, prevent any customer outages that are there. Uh, otherwise, if things are going well, we observe that DC for two days or so, uh, or even for a day, things look well, we are, we are having a tab on our logs, metrics, monitoring, alerting, everything in place. Things look good, go to the next DC, and then the next, until all data centers are covered. We make heavy use of something called as flippers. So what flipper does is, we hide our features, that we want to release behind a certain tag, and only users for which that tag is flipped uh, will be able to see the latest uh, features which are there. So we sometimes even do this for testing new features on users. Uh, so yeah, flippers have been really important uh, for releasing products. And yes, we have something called as playbooks for critical alerts. So let's say, a critical alert fires, the team needs to know what, need, what should be done and who better to tell them than the engineer who built it. So whilst we are developing, when we are towards the end of it, we basically develop these playbooks which are there, which gives you a step-by-step -step debugging approach into figuring out how do you get to the root cause of the problem and what commands or what should you do to fix it. So playbooks are really important for critical alerts and is an important step of post-deployment. Once we have playbooks for these alerts, certain, certain of these alerts, which, which we know can be repeatable and have very exact uh, solutions for them, those can be handed over to our cloud operations team. So for these alerts, the engineer may not be woken up at night. The, someone who's on call in the cloud operations team, they'll basically look at the playbook, figure out what steps need to be done and fix the issue. And we are in very close sync with the support team to see if any customer issues are reported while we are rolling out changes. Uh, yes, and no matter what, but whatever services we've, let's say, developed for VPC or any of the SDN teams, the engineering team is still always responsible for maintaining the, me the metrics, monitoring, alerting, and logs for this particular system and making sure that the system is healthy and fine. If things are not, then it's the engineering team responsible to fix it. Now I'll start talking about the engineering culture at DO. So we have globally remote teams and about 60% of the company is remote. Uh, people like my own team is spread across multiple time zones, but each person will have at least a good amount of overlap with 
uh, the Eastern Standard Time, which is the New York time zone, so that whatever collaboration needs to be done uh, will be done in those four to five hours where, where you have an overlap. But the rest of the time where you are singularly working, DO looks for engineers who are willing to take up individual responsibility for getting stuff done, uh, who are willing to work asynchronously and who are self-driven. So you should be willing to like finding solution. Most of the times you should be able to find solutions for uh, the things that you're trying to develop. That's there and a few points why I wanted to share and I feel that any engineering organization should have uh, so that they can have very passionate engineers building great product products. One is I've seen that there is zero micromanagement. Uh, the managers are extremely supportive. They trust you a lot, uh, give you a lot of freedom into exploring and even failing, which has been uh, very important for me. Geographical freedom to work from anywhere has been uh, like one of the big parts why I love working at DO. Uh, flexible hours in terms of, let's say if I have an emergency today, or for the next few days I want to work IST hours, then I'm allowed, then I'm open to do that. Uh, not a lot of permissions required for that as well. And trust in multiple dimensions. So even when I was a young engineer, when I, I remember when I was joining as an intern at DO, uh, they trusted me with a system that would be in production and handling, handling their own, handling something in their production systems, which if it went wrong, could cause issues in DO. I didn't even know Golang. But uh, at that time, they, was, they had that trust in me that you, by the end of these two months, you'll be able to deploy this system. And that proved to be really helpful. And this happens till day. There's a lot of responsibility, which uh, any engineer would love. Uh, there are world-class engineers with deep knowledge who come from varied backgrounds. Uh, just, just working with them is like a pleasure. And inherent willingness to share. Nobody keeps information within themselves. They always want to share what they have learned either through Slack channels or through, uh, or through talks. A lot of DO engineers give multiple talks within and outside DO. There is a tremendous culture of self-initiation. Uh, usually I've seen that people are not told what they need to do. They just pick up tasks and start finishing them. If they see something is wrong, they go ahead and fix it. Uh, so solve complex problems with the best tech resources and what better to use than open source technologies. Uh, yes, and these are some of the DO values, uh, which I see are very well aligned with what I just discussed in the last slide. And some of the people who are responsible, uh, there are multiple people, but I would like to point out Moise Uretsky, one of our co-founders, who was heavily invested in the idea of DO love towards our community and even within DO. Uh, Jessica Marucci and Katie Birch. They were some amazing people who have created this entire ecosystem of working at Dio and making people who work there love their work. So uh, this has played an important factor for me. Yeah, and that's my talk. If you would like to connect with me or leave any feedback, that's the public DigitalOcean handles and my handles as well. Thank you.